Now I would like to invite to the podium Dr. Jim Young Kim, President of the World Bank, for his keynote speech, please. First, I would uh, like to, um, excuse me, a little bit up. I'd like to also express my uh, uh, condolences to um, the, 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 the people of South Africa. Um, uh, Nelson Mandela has been a symbol of hope and integrity, a uh, fighter for social justice for so many of us, and uh, it's, a, it's a great loss uh, to, have, uh, um, uh, uh, to have suffered for the entire world. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shibusawa, for that kind introduction and for the excellent work of JCIE. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Minister Aso, Professor Takemi, and the Government of Japan for hosting us and for the continuing support, strong partnership between Japan and the World Bank Group. from Ethiopia, Ghana, Myanmar, Senegal, and Vietnam who are with us today. Thank you for your time and for your commitment to universal health coverage. It's very appropriate that we are meeting in Japan on the topic of universal health coverage. When it comes to universal health coverage, Japan has led the world by example. Japan achieved universal health coverage, as we've heard, 52 years ago, fully 17 years before the global community gathered in Alma-Ata to declare health for all and development in the spirit of social justice. The Kishi and Ikeda reforms that led to universal coverage promoted social solidarity and helped unleash Japan's rapid economic growth and shared prosperity. Japan is not only a leader in achieving universal health coverage for its own citizens, but it's also a leader in extending this commitment <coughs> to universal health to poor people around the globe. Through its leadership of G8 summits and its various roles in the global stage, Japan has helped mobilize substantial development assistance and has saved countless lives and advanced the health and well-being of millions. Today, there's a large and growing movement in developing countries to undertake the necessary comprehensive health reforms to achieve universal health coverage. To reflect this reality, the goal of universal health coverage should be firmly embedded in the emerging post-2015 global development agenda. The quest for universal coverage is not only a demand for better health, it's a demand for equity. At the World Bank Group, achieving universal health coverage and equity in health are central to reaching the global goals to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity. My colleagues and I at the World Bank are deeply committed to helping countries realize their aspirations for universal coverage. Our aims are clear. First, everyone should have access to affordable quality health services. Our commitment is universal, but the next 755 days until the MDG deadline in December 2015, we're putting a special focus on expanding access to vital services for poor women and children. We're helping the poorest countries scale up results-based financing programs that are already producing dramatic improvements in maternal and child health in countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. Second, no one should be forced into poverty or be kept in poverty to pay for the health care that they need. Every year, an estimated 100 million people, that's more than a quarter of a million people every day, face poverty as a result of out-of-pocket health care costs. So we must pay special attention to affordability for the poorest 40 percent of the population in every country. Third, all countries must harness investments in other sectors beyond health that provide essential foundations for a healthy society. Achieving universal health coverage requires solutions beyond the health sector, including targeted efforts in such areas as education, social protection, roads, transport, water, and sanitation, public finance, and information technology. For example, we know that one of the most successful interventions to improve child health has involved putting money in the hands of mother, poor mothers via conditional cash transfers. Air quality improvements, as well as tobacco taxation and road safety policies, can play a critical role in turning the tide on the alarming increase in chronic conditions and injuries we see today in so many developing countries. Helping countries advance universal health coverage is a strategic priority across the World Bank Group. Through our bank loans and technical assistance, 
we're partnering with middle-income countries to design and implement tough health sector reforms and contain costs, while at the same time expanding and sustaining coverage. Through IDA, our fund for the poorest, we're supporting the next generation of countries to lay the foundations for universal health coverage. Japan's continuing strong support for IDA in our current replenishment round is, will be critical if we're to scale up our efforts over the next three years. And through the International Finance Corporation, our private sector arm, we're helping both middle and low income countries harness the resources and innovation of the private sector, working in concert with the public sector. The private sector represents a large and in many cases, growing share of the healthcare market in developing countries. So the private sector must be integrated into universal health coverage reform efforts. While there's no single pathway for countries to achieve universal health coverage, all countries can learn from one another's experiences as they chart and calibrate their own paths. Why, for example, are some countries able to achieve better maternal and child health outcomes than others with the same level of resources? How have some countries managed a rapid expansion in coverage? What are the best ways for governments to engage private sector partners while ensuring equity and quality? As a global health community, we need to document, evaluate, and share lessons across countries to save lives, reduce spiraling health care costs, and d demonstrate value for money. That's why at the World Bank Group, we're placing a priority in what we're calling the science of delivery. We're gathering data and evidence on what works and what doesn't. We're beginning to, to systematically capture this knowledge, and then we'll make sure that these lessons from experiences around the world can be applied to local situations. This is where our Japan World Bank Group partnership on universal health coverage and this conference plays such an important role, yielding a wealth of practical lessons from country experiences. Today, I'm pleased to announce that uh, with our Japanese partners, we're releasing a synthesis of case studies from 11 countries that have achieved or are committed to achieving universal health coverage. These 11 countries are diverse geographically, culturally, and economically. But all these countries are demonstrating how these programs can improve health and welfare of their citizens and promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth. The good news is that many low and middle income countries are introducing fundamental reforms and achieving remarkable progress. So what are the main lessons from these uh, uh, 11 countries? Here are just five. First, one, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, strong national and local political leadership and long-term commitment are required to achieve and sustain universal health coverage. Two, short-term wins are critical to secure public support uh, for reforms, as in the case of Turkey, where hospitals were outlawed from retaining patients unable to pay for care. Three, economic growth by itself is insufficient to ensure equitable coverage. So countries must enact policies that redistribute resources and reduce disparities in access to affordable quality care. Four, strengthening the quality and availability of health services depends not only on highly skilled professionals, but also on community and mid-level workers who constitute the backbone of primary care. And finally, countries need to invest in a robust and resilient primary care system to improve access and manage health care costs. Not surprisingly, all of these cases also demonstrate that as countries move toward universal coverage, they will confront competing demands and continuing trade-offs. Countries face choices that can either enhance or erode coverage. The countries which have been most successful in expanding coverage have been in a mode of continuous learning from what's happening both inside and outside their borders and, and adapting their approaches based on the best available knowledge and evidence. A promising message from these case studies is that even low-income countries with low levels of health coverage can still aim for UHC. Countries can start by building their institutional capacity, learning from the experiences of other countries, and adapting innovative approaches that can catalyze the expansion of coverage. These are cross-cutting lessons. Now let's take a closer look at a few of these countries. In Turkey, an economic crisis in the early 2000s prompted major government reforms and laid the groundwork for the 2003 Turkey Health Transformation Program. Turkey cleaned up government deficits, created leaner and more efficient state bureaucracies, and also opened doors for reform in the health sector by breaking old interest group politics. Outcomes are impressive. Today, more than 95% of the Turkish population is covered by formal health insurance. The program now provides a high level of financial protection and equity 
while ensuring high and rising levels of patient satisfaction. Further, infant mortality rates have declined from 28.5 per 1,000 th live births in, in 2003 to 10.1 per 1,000 live births in 2010. Maternal mortality fell from 61 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2000 to 16.4 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2010. Turkey's example proves that financial constraints, even a major financial crisis, can catalyze the expansion of coverage. The bank group has, is, has been pleased to partner with the Turkish government to support this effort. Thailand, again, and as the, as the Thai officials constantly point out to me, Thailand, against the advice of the World Bank group, <coughs> uh, 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 ran, uh, revolutionized its workforce and uh, worked, working with a Thai network of rural doctors led for reforms. In addition to increasing the number of doctors and nurses, the government raised basic salaries and, <coughs> excuse me, and um, as a result of the health workforce scale up and other factors, popular utilization of essential health services has improved. Since the universal coverage scheme was introduced there, has been th there, there's been a declining trend in the incidence of catastrophic health expenditures, defined as out-of-pocket payments for health care exceeding 10% of total household consumption expenditure. The incidence dropped from 6.8% in 1996 to 2.8% uh, in 2008 among the poorest people in the program. The impact on province-specific incidence of impoverishment has been even more impressive. In the poorest rural northeast region of Thailand, the number of impoverished households dropped from 3.4% in 1996 to less than 1.3% 1 from 2006 to 2009. Each Ethiopia is another country that launched its health extension program in 2003 to promote universal coverage of primary care. The program delivers 16 clearly defined packages of health services for free. At the center of the program is a network of health extension workers all women, health, uh, all women who are 10th grade high school graduates and are recruited from their communities, trained for one year, and redeployed back into their communities. More than 35,000 health extension workers have been trained and deployed thus far, and their services are now in high demand from other sectors as well, such as adult literacy uh, or sharing of sustainable agricultural techniques. The challenge for them is to continue to enhance the skills and performance of these frontline workers and protect their time to ensure that they can provide communities with the quality health services they need. The latest uh, Ethiopia demographic and health survey data showed that between 2005 and 2010, child mortality fell from 123 per thousand to 88 per thousand, a 28 percent decline. Over the same period, Ethiopia also reports impressive reductions in both stunting and anemia among children, and anemia, excuse me, uh, stunting among children and anemia among women. Contraceptive use nearly doubled, contributing to a total reduction in total fertility rate. And in Peru, the government is leveraging its sovereign wealth funds to jumpstart ambitious reforms aimed at revitalizing, uh, re, excuse me, realizing UHC. The bank group is partnering with the Ministry of Health in Peru to develop a national set of indicators that will allow them to measure, monitor, and evaluate the expansion of coverage and take into account the epidemiological transition that the country is facing. These examples show that all countries face challenges uh, implementing complex health systems reform to achieve UHC. That's why we need global mechanisms through which countries can gain access to the latest experiential knowledge of what works and what doesn't and why. We need to understand why successful examples can be taken from abroad and implemented locally. This points to the importance of having a joint learning platform and network in which policymakers, practitioners, and development partners can engage on the practical how-to issues of universal coverage reforms and put knowledge into, into practice with hands-on problem solving. The World Bank Group is moving toward a global practice as a platform for supporting countries in achieving this, these goals. This also underscores the vital importance of measurement. Although priorities, strategies, and implementation plans will differ from one country to another, all countries need to make their universal health coverage policies and programs accountable and measurable so they can track progress and adjust as they go. But in order for countries to continue learning from one another and to benchmark progress, the world needs a measurement framework that can provide a common and comparable set of metrics. That's why at this conference, the World Bank and WHO 
are releasing a joint framework for monitoring progress toward universal health coverage with two targets, one for financial protection and one for service delivery. For financial protection, the proposed target is, is that by 2020, we will reduce by half the number of people who are impoverished due to out-of-pocket health care expenses. By 2030, no one should fall into poverty because of out-of-pocket uh, out health care expenses. This will be no small feat. This would mean moving 100 million people impoverished every year now to 50 million people by 2020 and then to zero by 2030. For service delivery, the proposed target is equally ambitious. Today, just 40 percent of the poor in developing countries have access to basic health services, such as delivering babies in a safe environment and vaccinating children. We propose that by 2030, we double that proportion to 80% coverage. In addition, by 2030, 80% of the poor will also have access to many other essential health services, such as treatment for high blood pressure, diabetes, mental health, and injuries. In the next three months, WHO and the World Bank will consult with partners to work out the details of tracking these targets. Yes, these targets are very bold, but we need bold targets to close the gap on universal coverage. Simply put, simply put targets drive action. Without the ambitious uh, three by five target for HIV, I wonder whether we would have been successful at getting 10 million people today and counting on antiretroviral treatment. So as we consult, let's commit to move this forward. Let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Countries' futures and many people's lives are at stake. In closing, I want to again recognize our hosts, the government and the people of Japan for their continuing commitment to UHC. We must do whatever we can so that every country in the world can benefit from the experience of Japan. Some 30 developing countries are implementing programs to achieve UHC, and many more are considering to do so. And I at the World Bank stand ready to help developing countries advance on the path to universal health coverage. And while this will not be easy, the lessons and experiences we are sharing today show that it is possible for all countries to realize this goal. It's been 20 years since the landmark 1993 World Development Report, which led to a generation of investments that produced dramatic achievements in global health. It's time to finish the job in this generation. Let's all leave Tokyo with a renewed commitment to ensure that everyone in the world will have access to affordable, quality care so that they may lead, they may lead healthy, productive lives of dignity, equity, and opportunities. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim.